Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, a little while ago, a friend of mine asked if I would tell the whole story of my two trips to visit the Matisse uh, people in the Western Brazilian Amazon in 2018, in February and October. And I realized I had never really told my whole story of that experience. And so I'm gonna to try to do that today. Um, I'm gonna to try to combine a little bit of travelogue with adventure and as well as a, a brief look at uh, this amazing uh, group of people who live in a world very different from ours in the jungles of, uh, of Brazil. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I ended up uh, going there. When I was uh, in college, uh, I did, I, after my freshman year, I really was not ready to sit still in class. And so I went to, to Mexico to learn Spanish. I took a semester off my, my first semester of my sophomore year. And I lived with a lower middle class family in, in Cuernavaca. And then I spent time living with a family in a small rural village in Oaxaca. Um, uh, the family wove rugs. And, and that was really the beginning of my interest in how people interacted with the geographical surroundings and the lands around them. Um, and uh, when I went back to school, uh, I decided that I was gonna major in cultural geography, which is really the study of the interaction between the natural landscape and how humans and the humans and, and how that creates kind of their, their cultural landscape. Uh, later in my sophomore year, I had an opportunity to go uh, on an extended trip to China. I dropped out of school again to do that. Uh, we worked in a farming village for a month uh, during the harvest season in Eastern Shaanxi province in the mountainous region. And again, my interest in people and their interaction with their land uh, uh, just deepened. Uh, to make a, a long story short, um, I never made it back to college and eventually I found myself uh, at IBM and I had a career of 33 years at IBM. I worked in the mainframe part of the business during that time uh, in many different capacities. And I made a lot of PowerPoint presentations and charts like this with a lot of circles and squares and arrows and, and acronyms, some of many of which I can't even remember what they mean anymore. And after 33 years, I retired and I took up sea kayaking is one of my hobbies and I never really looked back. And it was while I was uh, at a sea kayaking symposium down in Florida uh, that one of my kind of kayak coach mentors introduced me to a, a young man named Garrett Cooper and said, you might be interested in, in what this guy's doing. And, uh, and so Garrett gave a presentation to our group uh, about his um, company called Feral Human Expeditions. And he leads a lot of really interesting trips in various parts of the world from paddling down the Mekong River in Cambodia to building dugout canoes in the Peruvian Amazon. And then he talked about this trip that he takes to visit the Matisse Indians in far western the Brazilian Amazon. And, uh, and, and that's how this really, this story started. Um, so uh, my, I have a long interest in, interest in anthropology, although I'm not an anthropologist, uh, but I've studied, so this, these slides that you're about to see are really a combination of my own personal observations combined with a lot of reading of other anthropologists and academics, and I'm going to provide a combination of that information as we talk. So if you're planning to go to the Amazon, how, how do you prepare? Uh, and so one thing is you spray everything you're gonna wear with bug repellent. And, and my wife and daughter were not particularly crazy about me joining this trip. I had my own doubts. Uh, was this visit with the Matisse really a legitimate thing? Uh, what kind of experience did the trip leaders have? How safe was it to, to really be in, in, in the jungle? Uh, and would I personally be able to handle the the heat and humidity, bugs, the poisonous snakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I finally decided I've been interested in wanting to do this all my life. I'm just going to go ahead with it. So here I am on my way to JFK from my daughter's house in Sunnyside, Queens. And this is where we went. We flew from JFK to, to Bogota, Colombia. Uh, 
And I spent a few days in Bogota at the Tanaboca Nature Preserve, which is an eco lodge. And that's where our local guide, Gorin, was meeting us. And we spent three days with him, really, and, and Garrett, learning how to, to live and acclimate to being in the rainforest. Uh, when you're walking along, you got to look where you're stepping. If you trip, you don't just reach out and grab the nearest branch because there might be some sharp thorns or something that might bite you on it. Uh, and so we got acclimated. We took some an overnight hike in the jungle, and eventually we were ready. Um, and uh, and from there, we um, so so here's Letitia, which is right down on the southern little tip finger of Colombia. Uh, Letitia is right on the border with Western Brazil and also right next to across the river from Peru. This red territory right here is the, the Valley of Javari, which is the second largest protected indigenous territory in Brazil. It is the, the size of the state of Maine um, and it's the home of the Matisse. And it's also the home of a number of other indigenous groups, including the largest number of uncontacted tribes of any uh, geographical area in the world. Uh, they estimate maybe 16 uncontacted tribes in, 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 this, in the territory. Uh, there's an estimated 5,000 contacted indigenous population, and they estimate about 2,000 uncontacted Indians uh, in the territory. <laughs> Here's a close up of the preserve. Uh, the three dots in the middle are the three Matisse villages. Um, we got on a boat up in Tabatinga um, and we <clears throat> traveled for a full day, uh, a little bit on the Amazon, and we took a right turn up the Javari River, uh, and then a turn down the Itaqui, and then a right turn up the Quijoto River to a camp. Uh, that was just outside of the indigenous territory. And the Matisse traveled four, day, uh, four nights and five days by boats out of the territory uh, and then back up to join us in the camp. Uh, the territory is, is managed um, by FUNAI, which is the National Indian Foundation. And it's the Brazilian government body that establishes and carry out, carries out public relation um, policies relating to indigenous peoples. Uh, and they're responsible for mapping out and protecting the lands that have been traditionally inhabited and used by these indigenous communities. Um, and uh, they're also charged with preventing invasions of indigenous territories by the outsiders. So we were not really permitted to be in the territory, uh, which is why uh, they met us just on the outside. So here is the, a little canal right off the Amazon River, uh, which is essentially the, a port for small boats uh, in Tabatinga. Uh, and this is where we got onto our boat and loaded it up and, and headed it on out. At this point, the Amazon River is about 2,500 miles uh, from where it empties into the Atlantic Ocean and the elevation is about 297 feet above sea level. Uh, and so as we headed out, uh, the rivers were wide, uh, almost a mile wide at, um, when we started. And gradually, as we turned up one river to another river, the banks started coming in closer to us. You started to see uh, less civilization um, and, um, and, and less traffic from, uh, from other boats. We were there during the rainy season. And I'm not sure whose idea that was. Uh, but during the rainy season, the, the water can be as much as 50 feet higher than it is during uh, the dry season. And so water just spreads out over the bank and, and there's just water everywhere. Uh, now, the advantage of that is that um, with the water so high, you can have a river bend that could be almost 340 degrees or so uh, and instead of going all the way around that bend, uh, if you have local knowledge, you can take these little shortcuts and cut that bend off. Uh, and Estefan, our boatman, uh, had that knowledge. So we saved some time. And as we continued along, eventually we came to a marker, a red flag that the Matisse had let out for us so that we could see 
where to turn off the main river uh, up into a very small stream uh, to where our camp was, with, um, our joint camp with the, with the Matisse. So as we headed up this narrow, windy, twisty stream, I asked if I could uh, uh, assist at the bow uh, and help uh, Estefan get around these bends. And, um, and so I did. And the next video is that I'm going to show you uh, gives you just a little bit of an idea of what it's like to, to be on uh, uh, going up these smaller uh, rivulets. The, the water level went down. So I need to interrupt this adventure story uh, with a little bit of history. Um, I've mentioned uh, the term uncontacted tribes as it pertains to the Jabari territory. And so what does that mean? At first, I thought it meant that it was talking about indigenous groups that no one had ever even knew exist, no one existed and they never had contact with the outside world. And in fact, many of these groups have in fact had contact and those contacts were devastating experiences that date back to the 1500s. And more recently, uh, the rubber trade from the 1850s to the early 1900s was just a disaster for the Amazon indigenous populations. I read a firsthand account of two Americans who traveled into the Putumayo region of the Peruvian Amazon around 1907, and they described the treatment of Indians by rubber traders, rubber traders, uh, slavery, torture, starvation, murder, just unimaginable cruelty, very difficult book to read. Uh, the photo on the right shows the marks from whipping called the Mark of Arana, for Julio Cesar Arana, who was the head of the Peruvian Amazon company, uh, which by the way, um, was um, a, a British company. Uh, and these experiences along with violent invasions more recently from loggers and miners have pushed these indigenous populations deep into the most remote sections of the forest. So their, their isolation in many ways was self-imposed for, for survival. Uh, national attitudes towards the, the Brazilian indigenous population changed in a positive direction in the 1980s as part of the resistance to the military dictatorship in Brazil, which was there from mid, mid 60s to the mid 80s. And a new constitution in 1988 recognized the rights of the Indians um, over uh, the lands that they inhabit and also gave them exclusive use of the goods uh, and resources that were there within those reserves. However, it wasn't until 1998 that the president of Brazil designated the Valley of Javari as a protected territory. So when we got to the camp, uh, the Indians, uh, the Matisse weren't there. Uh, so we set up our camp. We were about a hundred yards from where their camp was and as we walked towards their camp to, to meet with them, we passed one of their cook fires. Uh, they had been out hunting that day and they had gotten four monkeys and two turkey vultures. And uh, we saw them boiling, I think together uh, in, in the pot. Um, so finally we met the, the Matisse and they were waiting for us and preparing a, a the tashik ceremony. Tashik is a traditional drink from a vine uh, which has very important cultural significance to the Matisse. Uh, the drink's prepared by scratching the vine with a small club that has monkey teeth in it. And uh, that's used to break up the outer bark. It's then mixed with some water and it's filtered through um, 
some kapok into a tashik pot. You see the three pots there on the ground. And then one pot at a time is passed around for a sip. And the first pot is quite bitter. And then as you drink the second and then the third pot, it gets less bitter until finally just a, a little bit of sweetness is, uh, can be tasted. And this is something that they often do when meeting outsiders uh, and, and, and also sometimes ready to do uh, some kind of a business transaction. Uh, when the Matisse uh, resettled next to the Funai outpost after suffering a lot of deaths in the early 80s from introduced illnesses uh, after they uh, first made contact in 1976, uh, they stopped performing uh, many traditional practices, including the Tashik uh, ceremony. Um, Later, uh, after living near the Funai and getting medical treatment for a number of years, they resettled in 2007 to, an, to a traditional area and they made sure that that area had sufficient uh, tashik and, and karari vines, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and then they restarted a lot of their traditional practices. And they claim that the tashik has helped them kind of regain their, their health and, and the population since then started to grow. At one point there were only uh, due to disease and illness after contact, they only had 87 people who were still alive, only seven people over the age of 40. Uh, and now their population's up to around 520. Um, one other point on the Tashik is initially it was just used only by men. Uh, and then when, when they restarted doing it, they included women in the Tashik ceremony. The next morning we all got together and then we met everybody uh, there were six families on the second trip that you see here in the photo. The first trip we had four families. Uh, and then we met kind of each family as a group one at a time. The family here uh, is the family of Iban on the left and his wife Cora and their children. Uh, the two young boys are, are four-year-old twins. And Iban is a highly respected member of the Matisse tribe. He's not a shaman, uh, but he's the founder of one of the three villages and a medicine man. Uh, and um, I'll talk more about him uh, later on. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out here is if you look at uh, the bracelet around his biceps and also around his neck, the, the white bracelet, uh, those are monkey teeth. Um, and they are an indication of a, of a skilled hunter who's able to provide for the family. Um, a necklace might consist of, that goes around the neck, might be 256 teeth. Uh, that would represent 64 kills. Uh, and, um, and so you'll see a lot of the, the Matisse men, particularly the older ones, wearing, wearing these necklaces. So after all the introductions, um, we got ready to go out uh, on a monkey hunt. Uh, this is Quini Buntak and, and Kini Shurapara, and they have um, Blow guns in their hands. Uh, the Matisse historically used blow guns, spears, and bows, uh, bow and arrow, uh, but the spears were abandoned long ago. However, the blow guns have an elevated practical and, and spiritual importance for them. They have more what they called show, uh, which is a shamanic substance of power for the Matisse. And the blow gun is a link between their ancestors and the present generation and it plays a central part in the Matisse intellectual universe. And a hunter's prestige is based on his skill as a, as a blow hunter, bow hunter, excuse me, as a blow gun hunter. This is the hunter survival pack and it contains uh, Karari tipped darts uh, that are used with the blow gun. Karari is a poison that's on the tip of the darts. And when a hunter spots a prey up in the canopy, he'll pull a dart from the quiver and I'll prepare it by packing a small amount of clay to help around the dart, to help guide it through the barrel. And then he'll take a little bit of the kapok, uh, which is like cotton, and he'll wet it and he'll um, put it around the end of the dart. And that'll provide some stability for the dart as it flies through the air. The clay is held in a, in a howler monkey jaw that's attached to the, to the quiver uh, on the outside. And then dangling from the quiver on strings are actually some piranha teeth. And they're used to score the end of the dart um, right behind where the karari is. 
so that it, as it enters the prey, it, it'll break off. Um, and those two sacs contain the cotton that you see. Also in the quiver is a, is a piece of wood and, and two special sticks. And those, that's a fire starting kit that they use um, when they're, they're out on the trail. So here you see him preparing the dart uh, before it goes into the blowgun. And here he is uh, aiming at uh, some monkeys that are way up in the canopy. If you look about a foot above his hands on the left-hand side, you see a little bump. That's a, a copy bar tooth that's been built into the plowgun and, and it's used as a, very much as a target site, like a rifle. Uh, the the blowguns are about 12 feet long. Each man makes their own blowgun and they never lend their blowguns to others. And women historically were not permitted to touch the blowguns, um, uh, but they, they will carry a shotgun for their husbands. Um, they had shotguns, we did not see them use them. Uh, and, and they make the blowgun from two halves of a car palm, carved palm wood wrapped in, in thin vine that they, they put some rosin on. Um, I mentioned the, the, the capybara tooth uh, eyesight. And then there's these rings around them, the white rings, and those are eggshells. And then there's also some uh, material on it that's crushed bone uh, with some kind of a sticky adhesive glue-like substance. Here you can see the length, length of the blowgun. Um, uh, the the blowgun is still the weapon of choice for hunting animals that are high up in the canopy, mostly monkeys and some birds. A monkey can be shot with a poison dart without disturbing the other monkeys uh, in the group. Uh, allowing for more opportunity to, to get more than one monkey, uh, a noise from a single shot of a shotgun and, and all the animals will disperse. Um, the other the advantage is this is really much very much of a bloodless kill in, in, in the Matisse value that. Um, now they were aiming up uh, into the canopy at, at a target that I could not see. Um, I did not see a monkey until it fell down out of the tree and got hung up in some branches uh, way up above us. And uh, I think this is Ivan's son who climbed up the tree to retrieve the monkey. He was pretty far up. You know, it doesn't look at with a telephoto lens. And I was a little nervous seeing him so up there, so far up there, but he seemed to be, it seemed to be business as normal for them. Here's Ivan with the, with a, with a monk, Saki monkey, uh, the, uh, for dinner. Um, this particular monkey will weigh about two to four and a half pounds. And I'm often asked if, if I ate monkey and uh, I did. Uh, it was very gamey and from my perspective, not very good. And if you read accounts of expeditions in the Amazon, most gringos don't like monkey meat. On the second trip, when we were, when we were going on the hunt, uh, one of the monkeys that was, was shot and came down out of the canopy was a female and it had a baby clinging to its back and they fell out of the tree together. The baby was crying, it, it was difficult to watch. And, and, and Tuma, one of the, the mothers that you'll see later on and her, grand, and her daughter uh, took the baby and pulled a lot of insects off of it. And then she handed it to her, her daughter. The Matisse loved their pets. Uh, they have a lot of pet monkeys, and after contact, one of the things they requested from Funai was some dogs. And I've read a, that a hunter's wife will actually take care of the baby monkey by masticating food for it, and sometimes even, even breastfeeding it. Uh, the Matisse prohibit the mistreatment of their household animals, and, and, and with the children having uh, pets like pet monkeys, they is they learn a lot of basic knowledge on animal behavior and physiology, which is important for, for their futures. Uh, there was a quote from anthropologist, Philippe Erickson that I read, he says, one of the ways in which mortals may establish permanent and friendly relations with the spirits is to adopt one of their children. So here's a little bit of what it's like uh, to follow these hunters through the jungle.
So in addition to the blowguns, the Matisse use bow, bow and arrow, uh, which occupies a lower status for them. Um, but the bow and arrow are, are used for terrestrial hunting uh, for games such as peccary, taper, and deer, or, or enemies or, or other humans. Uh, and there is a history of some tribal conflict, which we can talk about later on. Um, animals that are, that are hunted with a bow have a, low, a lower show status. That's that shamanic force that I talked about earlier. So they have a lower status than the animals that are hunted with, with blowguns. Um, even the tools that they use for sharpening the darts versus sharpening the, the arrows have a higher status. So a guti teeth uh, are, are used for the darts and pocket teeth for the arrows, for example. Pregnant women will express a preference for baby boys by stating that they'll become blow hunters. Uh, they don't talk about them being bow hunters. Um, and bow strings are, are made by women. Uh, and, um, and, and Tuma actually made one for me. That's a story maybe I can tell later on. Um, the men usually choose a single weapon uh, to hunt for the day. And by choosing the weapon, they're choosing the targeted prey. And blowgun hunts are usually solitary. Uh, hunting uh, experiences and, and the bow hunting is often done as a, as a group. So, so I talked about this different kind of show status. So there's a, every, everything in, in the Matisse world, animals, plants, possessions, fall into two main spiritual categories. There's the Ayakaba, Ayakabo on the left and the Tasibo on the right. And these characters map kind of feminine and male characteristics, uh, interior to the Matisse culture or exterior forces to the Matisse in community. Blow guns are in the Tasibo category on the right. Bows are in the Aikabo category on the left, uh, uh, associated with outsiders. And, and here you see a breakdown of, of how common animals that they hunt fit into this framework. Uh, the ornaments that the men wear don't go with the bows. So a lot of time when they're bow hunting, they'll take those ornaments off. Um, so, uh, and then here, just out of interest, you'll see the, the jaguar on the bottom right. They do, they do hunt jaguar. Uh, and so another thing that they showed us um, is our traps that they build. So in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes, uh, a group of men constructed a large animal trap for an animal such as a taper or a peccary. Uh, there's a, a bamboo spear that's attached to the spring branch and it's disguised, it's wrapped in a leaf. Uh, and here you can get an idea of how that works. Here's another flavor of a trap. In this case, the spring branch is, is horizontal. And, uh, and instead of one spike or spear, there's four of them. And the intended victim of this trap is a human. I'm not sure that this is something that they do anymore, but there is a history of intertribal conflicts. The Matisse have a, a tense relationship with a neighboring tribe called the Karubo. And as recently as just a few years ago, uh, there have been some killings that were perpetrated on, on both sides. Uh, and this is a longer discussion uh, that we don't have time to get into right at the minute. Um, and so we'll move on. They have tough feet. Uh, we saw them climbing trees high up into the canopy, uh, running through terrain covered with sharp ground cover. We gringos, we all wore knee-high rubber boots and socks. Uh, I got jungle rot on my feet from constant moisture and the difficulty of, of, of drying my feet. However, I was happy actually to have a little bit of protection from snake bites. Uh, at one point on the hike, they stopped us because there was a fair to land snake ahead of us on the path. These are very poisonous vipers that account for a high percentage of the snake bites in the Amazon and, and snake bite deaths in the Amazon. Uh, besides being poisoned, they're, they're aggressive. Uh, one of the men, when we saw the snake, cut a long stick down and then he went up to it and he whacked it very rapidly behind, the, behind its head and stunned it. 
He then stretched it out, whacked it a few more times, and then tossed it off the trail. So here you see Quinny is holding a root that they pulled out of the ground. And this was in preparation for a bouchette rit ritual, which they often will perform prior to a hunt. And what they do is they'll, they'll take this root and again, they'll scrape off the outer um, bark or skin of, of the root uh, onto a leaf. And they'll combine uh, those shavings with some water, filter it through some kapok, and they'll drop it into your, both of your eyes. Um, and while this is happening and the, the, the recipient's eyes start to sting, um, one of the Matisse will shout out the name of fast animals in the jungle, which will be repeated by the person who's being treated. And they'll be saying things like matakuna, matakuna, and they're referring to like junk, running deer, fast ants crawling, uh, and to um, kind of corral their strength in preparation for the hunt. Um, so I participated in this uh, myself and they repeated the names of the animals and I repeated them while rubbing my, my legs. It was quite painful. I couldn't open my, my, my eyes for four or five minutes. Um, when I was finally able to see, the colors were just brilliant. Uh, there was sharp contrast, like a 3D relief was, was enhanced. Uh, and I could see why this was a good preparation for hunting. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure how long it lasted, maybe a half hour, maybe longer, I'm not sure. You'll also notice in my pocket, there's this orange emergency whistle. Uh, Garrett gave each one of us uh, an emergency whistle to have on our bodies in case we got separated from the group. Uh, one of the things we saw more than once while walking through the jungle was some active, some um, logging activity. Uh, this tree had been cut down and, and, and roughly milled into some boards. And while we were not inside the territory, whether this would have been clearly illegal, um, uh, if done by non-residents, it, it just is an illustration of how um, lumbering is, is a major resource extraction target with loggers frequently making incursions into many parts of the Javari territory and creating a number of clashes that have resulted in deaths. The Funai outposts on the major rivers entering the territory um, have been undermanned for many years. And, and in some cases uh, recently, they've been abandoned uh, under the current President Bolsonaro. There's also been recent attacks on these outposts. Uh, this past September, uh, a longtime trusted Funai leader was killed in front of his house in Tabatinga by a drive-by motorcycle uh, gunshot after he had caught some men smuggling hundreds of turtles and 40,000 turtle eggs out of the Javari. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, you see standing uh, on the stump is Mike Herring. Um, he's a photographer who took a lot of the wonderful photos that you'll see in the, uh, in, in the slideshow. Uh, on the left is Garrett Cooper, who's a member of the Explorers Club, and he was our trip leader on the left. Uh, an interesting guy, not time to talk about it right now. And sitting on the log is Gorn, who is our translator and cultural interpreter. Um, and he organized a lot of the ground operations and is the owner of uh, Reserva Tanaboka and Leticia, where we stayed initially. Standing behind him is Victor. Uh, Victor is a Tacuna Indian, originally from Colombia, but now lives in Brazil and Atalaya. And he's an official guide for the Brazilian government. And it was mandatory that we have a, a Brazilian certified guide with us. He had extensive knowledge of the Matisse and the flora and fauna and, and was a great asset to our, to our group. When we got back from the hunt, hot and sweaty and, and tired, uh, Estefan had been fishing and he caught a number of fish and prepared them for dinner. I think these are piranha, uh, they were delicious. Now I want to give you a little idea of what it's like to camp in jungle during the rainy season. Uh, it was very wet. It rained multiple times a day for long periods. You would hear a little distant thunder, and then there'd be a little cool breeze that would pick up. And then there would be a clap of thunder right over your head and it would just come down and cats and dogs. Uh, 
after the rain uh, would pass, the sun would come out and the steam would just rise from the ground and it would become uncomfortably hot and, and humid. And then the cycle would just repeat itself. Uh, prior to the trip, Garrett asked me if I wanted to sleep in a hammock or a tent. Since I don't sleep well on my back, I said a tent. And uh, well, after the first day, my tent was surrounded, which is the green one on the right, uh, was surrounded in water. Uh, and so I had a hard time getting to it. And uh, I asked for some relief. Uh, here's the path uh, to my tent. You can see we cut, they cut down these palm fronds on the paths to try to keep our feet a little bit above the mud. And they had to do this multiple times while we were there. Here's the hammock they, they set up for me. Uh, you can see the hammock in the middle surrounded by mosquito netting and I would have to unzip the bottom of the net, stick my head through it. And then I would sit in the hammock uh, with my feet resting on those boards. Um, and I would, the idea is to pull your boots off and put them upside down on, on the two sticks and swing your body into the hammock. Uh, the first time I tried this was in the dark. And as I tugged on my boot, it came off suddenly and I flipped backwards and my head went into the mud. Uh, my legs got all tangled up in the, in the hammock and the netting. I cursed and I was just hoping that my fellow expeditioners didn't see me. And I never mentioned this until a, at least a, a full month later when we all met together at the Explorers Club in New York City. Um, and uh, so, you see here, my clothes are hanging up to dry. They, they never dried out. Uh, some others had problems with termites chomping, in, chomping holes into their expensive, expensive gear bags. Uh, my repellent worked pretty well for part of the trip, uh, but as time went on, the sand flies caught up to me and they just helped themselves. This is where we bathed. You had to walk out on those little logs and, and uh, stand on the boards while you washed off. Uh, one of the members of the group who will be, remain nameless uh, fell in, I believe. Um, and uh, this was about the only place that we could see the sun for during the four full days that we were in the jungle. So one evening, a few of the Matisse came and they got Mike uh, to go frog hunting with them. And uh, he described the experience to him. He said it was just beautiful. Uh, being in the boat, twisting down the river, uh, he could see the sky, the scars were brilliant and they were just using paddles, no motor. Uh, and they were also keeping their, their, their paddle blades in the water to avoid splashing sounds. And they were listening for the distinct croak of a, of a giant monkey frog. Uh, it was a walk sound. And, and when they heard it, Quinny climbed some 40 feet up into the trees with a flashlight in his mouth and he came down with, with two, two frogs. The, the hunters will ingest and treat themselves with, with various types of bitter substances, such as tashik that I talked about earlier, uh, such as the stinging uh, liquid in her eyes, the bruschette that I mentioned. Um, at one point, we put our hands into an anthill to experience ant bites. Uh, they rub their skin with irritating nettles and uh, Later, you'll see another ceremony that had some pain in it. And in this case, they take a poison from the frog, uh, again, to gain that empowering show force, um, which makes them better hunters. So they take the frog and they stretch it out over some hot coals, which irritates the frogs, and it starts to secrete the substance from the flanks of, it, of the frog. Uh, the woman will collect the secretions and, and put it aside. And then they take two sticks from, from out of the coals and burn two little holes in the shoulder. Uh, and this is where they apply the, the substance from the frog um, and is able to get uh, into, into the tissue in the bloodstream. And very quickly, this is Garrett here, the patient feels sick and they be begin to purge their, their guts. Uh, uh, the shaka, as they call it, that was harming them. Um, and after some, some minutes, uh, the woman will wash the, the substance off and, and the patient will re recovers pretty quickly. Um, we actually did a little experiment here where Garrett was set up with a blood pressure cuff, Garrett and, and Jeff Torres 
<laughs> both trained in wilderness uh, emergency medicine. Um, and, and Garrett's blood pressure uh, uh, dropped quite significantly while his heart rate went up uh, and he complained of numbness and, and, then, um, and then he emptied his insides out. Um, so while the men were, were hunting, the, the women were very busy gathering all kinds of things uh, from the jungle floor and, and up into the trees. Here she's carrying this, uh, a fruit called kupuwasu. Uh, we would see kids shimming high up into trees to get things. This fruit is in the cocoa family and it was uh, sweet and fibrous, a little bit banana-like, uh, a little sweeter and more liquidy-like. Um, they also gathered, um, gathered some uh, immature palm leaves, uh, which they'll, you'll see late, used later on for uh, various kinds of um, products that they make. Here you see someone uh, gathering uh, or um, cutting up some karari vine that was growing up the side of a tree. This is only done by men. Uh, and then karari uh, is where they get the poison uh, for the poison darts. Um, it's a, it produces, it's a powerful asphyxiant. And so when it enters the bloodstream, the poison's active chemical um, blocks the transmission of the nerve impulses to the muscle and that precipitate, precipitates a paralysis and, and halts the victim's ability to draw breath. And in the case of monkeys, they'll then lose their grip and they'll, they'll fall out of the tree. And um, so when we returned to camp, uh, they started the, the karari preparation process. They scrape the bark from the vine uh, and they gather all of those shavings, mix it with some liquid. Um, and, and here, uh, they, they pour that liquid through uh, a, a funnel that has some, again, some cotton in it and into a pot. And then they'll cook that pot uh, with the karari in it, uh, often for a few days. With us, they only did it for, for some hours. And, uh, and then they'll take the karari uh, and, with, um, and rotate the dart, uh, the end of the dart uh, with the poison and put that into their quivers. All right, I don't believe I'm doing this, but this is uh, a piece of karari that they just cut down from a tree. And uh, it's also used to treat malaria, actually. And so I'm gonna just take a little look at this just to show that I'm a tough guy. And we'll see how long this video keeps going before I fall over. Here, we're collecting sap from the side of a tree. And this sap will later be used to make uh, the ink for the tattooing. So back at camp, the sap was boiled down into an inky paste. And some of us volunteered to receive tattoos on our arms. And I, I felt honored that Iban uh, uh, did my tattoo. He painted a little strip of my arm and then he poked it in with the palm thorn. Uh, and I now have uh, three lines on my forearm after the two trips. And, um, and uh, the Matisse don't get it on their arm like I do. Uh, here's Tuma, who you've heard me talk about. Um, the, the Matisse refer to themselves as the Mushabo uh, or the two tattooed people, uh, or as wanibo, which is the peach palm people. The needles used uh, for the tattoo come from the peach palm. And this, this show, this substance I've been talking, this, this force I've been talking about, enters the body of the people by the tattoo and the distinguishing mark of the Matisse uh, with these parallel lines uh, running along their faces. Um, the Musha ritual, uh, also stopped as a result of the post-pandemic die-off in, in the early 80s. And it was restarted in 1986 after about, um, after some years. And it was viewed as an assertion of distinct Matisse identity. And it's passed down uh, as it's passed down through, from the ancestors. So a person will say, tattoo me as you were tattooed in the past. And the mythology is that tattooing was 
tattooing was taught to the Matisse by monkeys. Some of the younger people now are opting not to do, uh, not to get tattooed. Uh, and, um, and this is a source of, of some tension between younger people and older people uh, now in, in, in the community. So while the men were working on the Karari, the women were busy making mats from palm leaves. Um, and they were, uh, here you see some of the mats. Um, they, they also, from this, they make bracelets and anklets that you see. Uh, you've seen uh, the people wearing, uh, they make this cordage. And if you closely look at the patterns of, of the bracelets that they wear, you can see uh, patterns of these, of these kind of spots that represent uh, wildcats such as jaguar. Uh, here you see women uh, making some pottery uh, from clay that they collected while we were out on the hike uh, on the left. Uh, on this next picture, uh, you see a Marawin mask. Um, uh, the women will make the basic shape of this mask and then the men will decorate it in preparation for the Marawin ceremony. So the Marawin ceremony is, is central to Matisse culture. Uh, the Marawin are, central, are ancestral spirits and they, they live in abandoned garden clearings and cliffs in the sides of riverbanks. And they will occasionally visit the Matisse villages to whip children, to make them grow faster and stronger and rid them of laziness. They'll also whip pregnant women to benefit the unborn child. And they'll also even whip the plants during corn harvest. It's not a punishment. Uh, the Matisse never spank their children. Uh, and then this lash that they get transmits this chimu energy, the bitter show energy. Um, the same force that you, you they get from the Karari uh, from, uh, uh, from the Marawin spirit into the person receiving the lash. Um, so when they come out of the woods uh, dressed like this, uh, they're all covered in, in, in clay. Uh, they don't speak. Uh, they make these kind of grunting sounds. Um, and um, this ceremony was also stopped for many years uh, um, uh, after the Matisse uh, experienced the pandemic and, and his practice has now returned and is again central to now the Matisse culture. <laughs> So I uh, did this myself. Uh, I got two lashes. It hurt. Uh, I have a mark like I had a mark like this on the my back also, uh, but it didn't get affected fortunately, and and uh, and I'm better for the experience. So not everything is is um, is our physical challenges and pain. They have a lot of fun. Uh, this is one of the, the dances they perform for us. This is called the wild pig dance. Uh, the men and the young boys entered from the forest, kind of a conga line formation, and they danced in circles, making low rhythmic grunts and they occasionally high pitched hoots. And, and everyone was smiling and laughing. They did a number of different uh, shows like this for us. This is another one. This is the capybara ceremony. <laughs> They're holding balls of clay with a plant sticking out. They're covered in, uh, their bodies are covered in clay. And then uh, they run out and they try to rub themselves up against everybody to, to, uh, to get them all dirty also. So in exchange for the, the privilege of spending time with the Matisse, and taking perhaps thousands of photos and hours of film, we gave the Matisse two new outboard engines. So this was a, a transactional agreement between the two groups. Uh, an early film crew from the BBC some years ago that visited the Matisse uh, had this exchange with one of the Matisse tribal chiefs. He said, 
The outboard motor you bought us won't last long, but the images that you take will last forever. And so of course, this raises all kinds of questions uh, that perhaps we can talk later during the Q&A. Uh, the Matisse are not naive, primitive, stuck in the historic past. Uh, they are very active agents in, in directing as best as they can their own transformation and, and their interactions with, with the changing world around them. So while on one hand, they're trying to reinforce their traditional customs, particularly with the younger generation, uh, such as encouraging women to partake in, in the chic ceremonies and, and also asking the younger women to cut their hair shorter, which is the traditional way that Matisse women care, um, uh, cut their hair, uh, but they're also sending some of their children to school in, in Atalaya, the main city outside the territory. And they, they know that these boat engines are, are, are powerful agents for change uh, and, and transformation. The key thing is that they're the ones in my mind who are setting the terms and doing this by their choice and not uh, by someone else's choice. So on the fifth day, we said goodbye to the Matisse and we headed out uh, back towards Letitia. <clears throat> and as we headed down river, um, while I was kind of consumed in my thoughts, trying to comprehend what I had just experiences, experienced, uh, we saw the clouds build up uh, and a storm moved in. We were just deluged uh, with strong winds. At one point we had to take shelter behind a river bank in the, in the lee of the wind. And then later on, uh, our boat got stuck. We all had to get out and, and, and push it to get, get us off the, the muddy bottom. And so the, the Amazon uh, didn't let us go uh, easily. And so we were headed back towards Atalaya where we were gonna have lunch. And on the way, uh, we saw a pretty large uh, lumber mill. We saw some smaller ones also. And um, so we were once again reminded that the resources of the Javari region are, are highly sought after by the industrialized world. And the profits are for few and the subsistence jobs are, are for many. As we pulled up to the dock in Natalaya, uh, we saw a curious looking boat uh, that was built up on a very precarious bottom. And a large number of people were on this craft. Uh, the men had long beards and, and the women wore long scarves over their heads. And Gorn told me that they were members of the Israelitas religious sect. Uh, in this sect, they follow a, a self-styled spiritual leader in Peru who calls himself the Christ of the West. And they believe in a mixture of the Old Testament and Inca values. Uh, and they think that Peru is the promised land and they've grown very rapidly and their political party actually just got the second most votes in, in Peru. And they're now also starting to spread into the Brazilian Amazon. The Matisse have um, a house or two in Atalaya that they stay in when they go in to, to go to market and do trading uh, or to meet some of the children who are going to school there. Um, <clears throat> But I also want to draw your attention to the biblical verse on the outside of the Matisse communal residence in Atalaya. Uh, missionaries for decades have been trying to get uh, into uh, the indigenous territories and, uh, and convert the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Uh, when we flew into Letitia uh, from Bogota in the beginning of our trip, there was a whole group of uh, missionaries from the United States who were on the plane with us. This is a a uh, web page uh, from the Joshua Project. Uh, and uh, on the right, uh, they've identified the location of the Matisse. This is specifically for the Matisse, this particular page. Uh, the missionaries are often known to have the best maps of the Amazon interior. Um, they have some basic facts and there's a color coded scale, scale that you see on the left uh, that shows at the moment that the Matisse are in the red zone for having 0% evangelical conversions. Uh, but you can help change that by selecting the prayer card button. And for a donation, you can get a card and you can pray uh, for the salvation of the Matisse. Um, since the election of Jair Bolsonaro, who's now the president of Brazil, 
Um, in fact, that election took place the day that we were in Atalaya. He's tried to eliminate these restrictions and he actually assigned the missionary uh, to be a head of uh, the Funai agency. Um, Goran told me that, that missionaries will send in linguists and, and in four months time, they can learn the language well enough to translate the Bible into that language. And uh, under the guise of humanitarian aid, they'll attempt to convert a village leader. And once they're successful in that, the, 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 the culture of that group will, will start to um, disappear. At the bottom uh, is a uh, reference to Ethnos 360, which is a missionary group based out of Florida. They've recently purchased a helicopter so they can go into the Javari region. Uh, their mission is to convert the last tribes regardless of where that tribe might be. Uh, those helicopter flights into the Javari territory are illegal. Um, there have been attempts to stop them, uh, but it's believed that they're still, they're still doing it. So th these are some quotes from the president of Brazil, Bolsonaro. Uh, and uh, the three points here, you see no, there's no indigenous territory where there aren't minerals. Gold, tin, magnesium are in these lands, especially in the Amazon, the richest in the world. I'm not getting into this nonsense defending land for Indians. Uh, and uh, indigenous reserves are an obstacle to agribusiness. Uh, we're gonna give a rifle and carry a permit and a carry permit to every farmer to protect against the Indians. It's a shame that Brazilian cavalry hasn't been as efficient as the American one, which exterminated the Indians. Uh, the Javari territory is now pretty, it's the protections have, uh, have pretty much fallen away. There are incursions all over. Uh, the indigenous groups in the Javari are starting to raise the alarm. Uh, and as you see from, from this discussion, the, the Matisse are highly tuned to, to their natural environment. And by protecting them and, and their way of life, you're really protecting the, the rainforest that they're living in. And the Amazon rainforest is a huge carbon sink and a huge resource uh, for fresh water for the world uh, and has a very significant impact its future on our, our global climate. And so by protecting the Matisse way of life, we're protecting the Amazon rainforest. And by doing that, we're really protecting all of our, our futures. Um, so with that, I'd just like to, to wrap up. Uh, one day Garrett took me up to the camp. I was gonna give the kids uh, some small little gifts that I had bought them. They weren't there, they were down swimming by the river. So we went down, um, I was a little nervous, but the kids didn't seem to be nervous. Garrett jumped in, so I stripped down to my underpants and jumped in. And this was my favorite experience of the trip, uh, just swimming in the water with a bunch of kids, having a lot of fun. And, and so, so what will the future for these kids be like? Uh, they're, they're doing, from their end, they're, they're carefully balanced on a balance wire, managing their relationship with the outside world. Um, and from our end, the question is, what are we going to do to ensure their futures? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the time that you spent with me. Um,